different talk because I have a lot of ideas about what Roger's talking about. But Boris asked me to look back at upper and lower case, or UNLC. The name comes from the one of the versions of what a designer would write on on the manuscript to be typeset, meaning typeset it in caps and lower case. Um, I was the last editor because the company was shut down by the corporation that owned us. Uh, we were a, the type company was too small to be part, even noticed by the larger corporation, and that was uh, 15 years ago. So I'm assuming most of you don't actually aren't familiar with upper and lower case. But at the time it was published, from 1973 through the end of 1999, it was probably one of the most widely read design magazines in the world. And it, it came out of New York. It came out of the New York advertising field. Um, it came out of the photo typesetting revolution. Uh, and it reached all around the world. It was not just local. ITC, International Typeface Corporation, was created in 1970 and at the height of photo typesetting, when you were still you were still using um, heavy machinery, essentially, although it was photographic rather than mechanical, to set type. But the idea was you could, it was much easier than in metal to sell a design, and then that design could be adapted to each machine. So the founders of UNLC decided to license the same design to all the competing type typesetting companies. And in 1973, they realized that the best way for them to advertise was not to buy expensive ads in all the existing publications, but to create their own publication and send it free to everybody in the business. And that's exactly what they did. This is the first issue. It was done very cheaply on uh, newsprint, black and white originally, and sent out, basically you just said you were in the business and you got it. It went to all the type shops, it went to all the designers, and that would create a demand for those typefaces in the clients who would say to the type manufacturers, we want this font on your machine. Uh, it was a time of um, hmm, the New York publishing, the New York publishing and advertising field was was very strong at the time, and most of the typefaces designed in originally for uh, ITC were intended for advertising brochures. They were typefaces like ITC Garamond is not a book typeface, despite being called Garamond, but it is a brilliant typeface for brochures and ads in that style. And uh, ITC sold typefaces uh, around the world. They did quite a few Cyrillic typefaces. And the magazine showed these off. That was its purpose. It was um, intended not to be direct advertising. That is, uh, as Roger was saying, people get pissed off at advertorials when they think they're at reading something real. There was clearly promotional copy in upper and lower case about the new fonts. They would feature a new font and a new type family each, uh, each issue. But most of it was just stuff that was of interest to the readers. It uh, was founded by Aaron Burns on the left, uh, sorry, Herb Lubalin on the left, who was the designer. You saw some of avant-garde and some of his other um, designs earlier. Uh, Aaron Burns, who was the type businessman, and Ed Ronthaler, who actually had owned photo typesetting, uh, sorry, photo lettering for many years in New York, which supplied the type to most of the advertising business. So Roger told me an anecdote at lunch yesterday about uh, how they actually started this, which I'll ask him about in a little bit later. So prototype setting meant you could do things like this, as opposed to metal, where you had to actually cut it to do things like that. Um, and so upper and lower case celebrated the possibilities of photographic design, phototype setting design. This only Herb LeBallon could get away with doing things like this, hyphenating the headline and jamming together all these typefaces. But 
Well, as you saw the avant-garde uh, logo earlier, Herb Lubellon could do things like that that nobody should try to imitate, and they still do. But UNLC was, as I say, it was soft marketing. It was, it was, its purpose was marketing, but it was not a, an advertising piece, although parts of it were. And occasionally they would do things like bind in uh, a brochure about particular fonts, which is what that lower part of that page is. It's actually a separate bound-in section. This was from the very first issue. Is avant-garde avant-garde? And uh, it's a lovely little... Uh, description by Herb Lubellon of how he came to, to do it. All of, almost all of the issues of UNLC have been scanned and digitized and are available on the web. And at the end, I'll give you a, a, a URL to find those. So that's, that's a recent development. Uh, but you can go and read this there. So basically, Everybody got UNLC. All, every, all the students got them, or actually probably every, somebody in every school got them, and then it was passed around and around. Uh, every design studio got it. People would have their own subscriptions or read somebody else's copy. All the type shops had them. Uh, and today, you still find people keep these stacks of old UNLCs, and they got rid of all their very fancy, heavy design magazines. But it's amazing. Every time I ask people, well, do you need some copies of the old issues? They say, no, I've got them. I've always had them. I just don't throw them out. The, some of the pages were sort of obsessively typographic. Uh, they often did things like just alphabets made up of weird shapes that they could come up with. And it was not a quiet magazine. It was visually in your face, exuberant. And it was about exuberance in typesetting. Uh, this was a period when the style was really big letters jammed together, because you could do that with photo typesetting. You had not been able to do that in metal. Now, of course, we can do anything digitally, and including getting into a lot of trouble trying to pretend we are Herb Lubellon. But uh, I've actually find that a very poor choice for text, but it was in style at the time. It works very well for headlines sometimes. And Lubalin basically represented the, the vision of typography as uh, expressive typography, it's been called. He called it typographics, uh, but his work was extremely expressive, extremely uh, related to making the type embody the message. But he died relatively young. Um, on the left is Bob Farber, who took over as, as art director, and on the right, Ed Gottschall, who edited. Uh, Lubalin had done both. He had been both the editor and the designer. Uh, Bob Farber's style was a little bit more restrained, but very, very dramatic. These page spreads are among my favorites in the history of the magazine. And occasionally they played. The, Ed Gottschall told me this was the only layout he ever wrote the copy to fit into. Usually it was the other way around. You, the editor would give the designer the copy, and the designer would make it fit somehow on the page. But just to play around, they did it the opposite way this time. So there would be almost anything in UNLC. Uh, it wasn't necessarily about type, it wasn't even necessarily about graphic design, but it was about things that would appeal to graphic designers. So it was looked forward to. Everybody wanted to see what, what was in UNLC in the next issue. It, it provided a chance for everybody, anybody who was designing the type, the, uh, the magazine, to just play and the readers got to see their world, the design world. And it changed, the next change happened when uh, Ed Gottschall retired as, as editor and there's a, a, a uh, one of your uh, page spreads, Roger. Margaret, Rich, Margaret Richardson took over as the third editor 
And she changed things around a bit. She started doing theme issues, and she had a different art director for every issue. That made it even more unpredictable. You never knew what was going on in UNLC, or what would be going on, what it might look like. But you knew it would be interesting. Usually fascinating, uh, usually highly effective, and everyone wanted to see what they would do next. There were a few that stretched the readability, uh, legibility issues. I, I suspect Sebastian Carter was not really fond of this layout on his historical article, but I don't know. This issue was perhaps the most controversial one. The pages was actually organized in horizontal strips, and it read from the story read from strip to strip, from page to page, instead of reading a page and then the next page. It was nearly impossible to navigate, but it got attention. And Margaret was always happy to get attention for the magazine and for the type. This is Steve, one of Steve's retrospectives on design in UNLC, which he did several times for us. Or for us, I came in quite late. I can only take responsibility for the last two years. So it was all about mix, making the form and the content work together in interesting ways. Which, of course, is what typography on this scale is about. It is, uh, it is the melding of a content and form. And it, of course, always showing off ITC typefaces. You could always look on the page or at the end of the article, depending, and see what typefaces had been used. Because there was, of course, a basic purpose to this, to sell the fonts. Um, when ITC started, phototype setting was ruling the day. Uh, as I said, you, they could license the fonts to all the manufacturers, and the, the fonts would be created for the specific machines. And it was still the day when designers would send out type to be typeset. You, would, you could not do it yourself. The, you didn't have anything to do it yourself on. That completely changed with the introduction of personal computers, and particularly the Macintosh, with the introduction of PageMaker, and later Quark Express, and InDesign, and other publications that put the typesetting into the hands of designers, for better or for worse. So while UNLC would have been full of advertising, remember it was started so that ITC would not have to buy advertising in other publications, they actually sold advertising so successfully at its heyday that they act, uh, there were times when they turned down ads. Mike Parker, who is a uh, design editor, uh, typographic director of Linotype, told me that for many years they would just routinely buy five pages of advertising in every issue of upper and lower case. Berthold advertised. But then in the later years, in the late 90s, everything became digital, and ITC was both selling, licensing the fonts to the various manufacturers and selling directly. So it had quite changed quite a bit. When I was asked by Mark Batty to take over editing in 19, well, I started in 1998, um, they had already made a, a dramatic decision to change the size. Uh, IT, uh, UNLC had always been tabloid size, roughly A3 paper size, the, Ameri the American equivalent. And this was down to half of that letter size, the equivalent of A4. I actually liked that format, but very many people objected, but I had nothing to do with it. It was already a decision made when I started. And it startled a lot of readers. But the designer who was designed almost all of the last issues, Mark Van Bronckhorst, uh, a wonderful designer in the San Francisco Bay Area, took those small pages and made them big, and made it just jump out of the pages. Obviously, you can also see that the, the ITC fonts had changed a bit from those things in the 70s. This is Justin Howes' uh, revival of Caslin at various sizes from the originals, ITC founders Caslin. And this page is one of my favorites. Mark Batty wasn't so happy with it, but it shows the different sizes and styles. And when we put this on the web, uh, we made each of those little blocks a link to a separate type sample. So Mark's uh, design worked very, very well. It was in many different styles. Uh, 
a retro style for a retro seeming typeface, a lot of uh, display faces in different styles. And I mentioned the reach around the world. This is from the issue uh, with Adobe Caslin. I mean, sorry, not Adobe Caslin. ITC Founders Caslin. Um, but this article by Eileen Gunn about the Zimbabwe designer Saki Mafundikwa uh, reached people here in Germany who were interested in the book that he had not yet had published based on African alphabets, which created a demand that eventually was published. It also, he also told me that uh, there was a designer in Harare who didn't know about Ziva until he read about it in UNLC. So I was very happy with the, the reach we had around the world. The other thing that I was given as assignment when I started was to create an online companion because uh, the fonts were being sold from the website now. That we wanted to drive people to the website. That, uh, that bar was designed by Roger's uh, company, except for the logo, which came later. Um, so there was already an, a UNLC online in name, but it wasn't really a publication. It, uh, I created it as a periodical. The idea was to have monthly issues between the, the quarterly print issues, and I numbered them uh, at a little techie conceit, uh, numbered them as though they were version numbers. So, And I thought, what do you want to actually read on an uh, online magazine? Uh, of course, today, a monthly online magazine seems absurdly slow, but it made sense at the time. And I thought, I followed the principle somebody once called news, views, and reviews. We had columns, reviews, reports on events like this and other related things. This was the numbering system. Um, and so you can see sort of issue by issue as you look down there. Uh, oddly, I'm going to go back a moment. Oddly, at that point, uh, everybody was worried about large files and not having a big download and, and loading time for websites. So there's not a lot of heavy graphics here, even though you also had very poor control over typography. So this was a website of the late 90s. So we had very small uh, graphics just as links to the articles. And three columnists, Olav Martin Gavern, Eileen Gunn, and Bruce Sterling, who is a well-known science fiction writer and futurist, but I believe I was the first editor to get Bruce writing about design, which he later became very enthusiastic about and has written about quite a lot. These columns were, uh, you, know, you, you go to a magazine and you want to find out what the columnist wrote about next. That's, that's one of the things that gets people coming back. That was the principle. And again, ironically, these, all of the images here are from fonts. Each of those little images, like the armadillo, the cat, uh, came from a des what they called a design font, basically a font full of pictures instead of, of letters. But since there were no web fonts at the time, there was no way to use those fonts on the web, we then created, turned those into images, and that's uh, a static image on the screen. And there was some material that would be in the print magazine and, and come into the online magazine, and was, and some that was unique to online and some that was unique to, uh, to print. The idea was, as I said, to get people to want both, to go back and forth. This Paul Lorena review was in the print magazine and online, for instance. So there was one thing that really got people upset. We thought they'd been upset at the idea of a smaller page size. We ch Mark and I decided it was time to change the logo. The old logo, which some people angrily called classic, which probably would have amused Herb Lowell in no end, was, uh, was flamboyant, uh, exuberant. It reflected this, the times of the starting UNLC. This is from the first issue. But it also fought with everything else on the page. This was a later version of it, much cleaned up and a little, a little more air in there, but still very exuberant. The, things late, uh, the late issues that would sometimes show up on the cover in very subtle ways. 
But we decided that, especially with UNLC Online, the smaller size, the, the way things were going digitally, it was time to come up with a more typographic logo and break with that exuberant past. So we came up, Mark came up with this, and my first issue was the 21st, 25th anniversary issue, which uh, bid a fond farewell to the old logo. Perhaps a little too fond. Some people were unhappy with this, I love this cover that Mark came up with. This was clip art from the 70s. So, when Esselte, the corporation that owned ITC, shut us down at the end of 99, uh, my last few weeks were spent finding homes for the, uh, the archives so they wouldn't end up in a dumpster on East 45th Street. It was a very frustrating transition for everybody involved because the company, the larger corporation, simply wasn't interested in bothering to let us sell the company, buy the company, sell the magazine. Um, but for the very last issue, it was striking. Uh, Mark Van Bronckhorst was busy. The last issue was designed by Deanna Lowe, a New York designer, and she also managed to make it spring off the page. Uh, very happy with the way these things turned out. So UNLC started in a heyday of phototype setting. We adapted to the digital world, but it, it was, I think, as Steve has said, and probably Roger too, it didn't entirely work, although we were still fairly successful at the time. Um, but it was primarily part of the phototype setting era. And the magazine is still in those stacks in people's basements, people's attics, and now online. <laughs> 